Today we're going to continue our discussion of frameworks for deep learning, and this time we'll not just talk abstractly about computational graphs and how you do backprop in them automatically, but explicitly look at some code and how this gets implemented in PyTorch. So first, let's start off with a very simple model, a model doing logistic regression. So let's take a look at this code snippet here. So we're going to define a model that implements logistic regression. And you can see here that at, when we create this class, we have a new class called logistic regression, and it's going to take as its parent class the module class from PyTorch. And this basically says this is something on which we can do automatic differentiation. And we will then initialize our class here. So this is just calling the constructor for the parent class. And then we're going to tell our model what its parameters are. In this case, we just have a single linear layer that is already defined. And we just need to tell it the size of the dimension that defines the linear transformation that we're going to be using. In this case, it's going to take in some number of features and output a distribution over some number of classes. OK, so that's defined the parameters of the model. And everything that you're going to implement also has to have an output function or a forward pass, as we talked about last time when we talked about computational graphs. And here, it's very simple. We just take whatever input we get, and then we run it through our linear layer, and that's our output. So one thing that you may be noticing here, uh, since this is doing logistic regression, is where is the softmax function? Where is the pass into the logistic function? That isn't happening yet. That will happen later once we define the loss function. So these things get a little confusing when you're uh, combining loss functions with the parameters, but the loss function will be implicitly defined once we incorporate the loss function. But in this case, we're just taking some linear operation, applying it to an input vector, and adding in a bias. That's all that this class is doing. And later, when we define the loss function during optimization, the softmax function or the logistic function will come into play. OK, so now let's play around with this class that we've just created. So here we can create a new instance of our logistic regression class. Let's say that it takes in five features and outputs a binary distinction between two classes. And so we can initialize our logistic regression as follows. And then we can now take a look at the parameters of this function. So We've just called this function parameters, and it says, hey, there's this linear layer that's called linear. How does it know that? That's kind of uh, freaky, because we didn't define any parameters before, and nor did we list the parameters of our logistic regression function. So let's go back to our code and, and see what's going on there. So what happened is that we created a new member of this class. We created a member called linear, and it is a module. So it is a linear function, and once you add any member to a class, anything that is a subclass of a module will keep track of all the things that you've added as members and list them as parameters. So that's how it knows implicitly that linear is a parameter of this function. OK, so now we can start looking at the actual numbers involved here. So Recall that we have a linear transformation that's of the form AX plus B. So this is our linear layer. That's the parameter of our logistic regression class. And so the weight corresponds to this matrix here. And the bias corresponds to this vector here. And the bias corresponds to this vector here. So at this point, you may ask yourself, where the heck did these numbers come from? You didn't tell it these numbers. They're not all 0. They're negative and positive. How did this happen? 
So to understand that, you have to go back and look at the definition of the parameters that you're using. In this case, we use linear. We could also have used bilinear as our parameters. And typically what happens is that there is a function called reset parameters that tells you how to define a new set of parameters if you initiate your function. Typically, there is a function called reset parameters that tells you if you're creating a new instance of this class, how should the parameters be set? Or if you just want to reset the parameters, how do they get set? So this is the beauty and the peril of working with a framework like PyTorch. PyTorch does a lot of things for you and you may not know all of the things that it's doing for you. Most of these things are good, but occasionally they will bite you. And so you need to kind of learn these sorts of things that are happening. And I'm sometimes surprised at some of the things that are happening. Uh, and PyTorch is constantly changing, so this is one of the battles of working with a framework like this, to understand all the nice things that well-intentioned folks who develop this framework are doing for you, but to know that they're happening and to know how to tweak them if you need them to be slightly different. Another nice built-in feature of PyTorch is that you can move computation to the GPU by calling a specific function to a variable uh, I won't talk too much about this, but this is something you should be aware of, particularly if you have a GPU that handles CUDA. So uh, know if your computer does that, and if your computer does that, take advantage of it as much as you can. This, again, is one of the nice things built in PyTorch. Okay, so let's take a look at how this model computes a forward message. So let's create a vector x. We'll then set it all to 1, and then we'll pass that through our logistic regression function, and then we get weights for each of our classes. And so in this case, it's negative 0.2 and 0.5 for the weights for our classes. Again, this hasn't gone through the logistic regression function yet, so these don't represent probabilities yet. This is an example of running a forward computation. In cases like these, where we've only used existing modules, we don't need to then compute a backward step. If we were computing something new and strange that PyTorch doesn't know about, then we would also have to compute a backward step so that it knows how to do auto differentiation. In this case, you'll need to create a function that can compute the derivative uh, with respect to all of the variables in the function. And you don't need to do that if some of the uh, variables will not need a derivative. So for example, if something is never going to be optimized, if it's a uh, hyperparameter or something like that, you can just return none for the gradient in that case because it will never be needed. Okay, so now we've defined a function and we've defined our logistic regression model. So now how do we actually learn the parameters of that model given some data? So to do that, we're going to need something called an optimizer. And so an optimizer is something that has an objective function or a loss function, tries to minimize that loss function according to some schema. So we've talked about stochastic gradient descent before. There are other things uh, that you can use like Adam and Adigrad, things like that. Regardless, most of these things are implemented in PyTorch. You can choose any one of those optimization functions and then once you have a model and a loss and some examples, you can compute a loss for an example. That then gives you a gradient with respect to each of the parameters. And then using the optimizer, you can take a step, like we talked about for stochastic gradient descent, in a direction that improves the objective function for that parameter. And then you repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. So let's take a look at how this gets implemented in code for logistic regression. So in this case, let's say that you have your stochastic gradient descent optimizer, and all of these optimizers are going to have different parameters. And so stochastic gradient descent just has a learning rate. So you need to tell it what learning rate you're going to use. And then what we're going to do is we're going to run some number of epochs, i.e. how many passes are you going to take over the training data? And then for each example, you're going to first reset your optimizer. So your optimizer might have had some gradient before. 
So this resets it so that it knows that it's getting a new gradient. You're going to get the prediction of your model on a document, and then you're going to compute some loss. And so this is where the final computation of the logistic function comes in. We're using a cross entropy loss, so this implicitly gives us the probability distribution over classes, and that gives us an implicit softmax or logistic function application that we need to make this actually logistic regression. So this is the same loss that we talked about when we did logistic regression by hand, but the great thing is that PyTorch is now doing it for you. And so now you have the loss function, and you can then compute the backward step over all of the parameters. And so we have a very simple computation graph in this case. We just need to go to the A and the B. And so this is exactly what you did by hand, but PyTorch is doing it for you. And then you take a step in the optimizer, and so here the optimizer has access to the internals of the logistic regression class that you defined, and it changes those parameters ever so slightly based on whatever learning rate you're using. And so this is where the initialization of the optimizer comes into play. You need to tell it what all of the model parameters are, and you need to tell it how much to change them every time you call this step function. And so now we have a slightly improved logistic regression model, and we're going to keep doing that again and again and again over all of the data points in our example until we have a good model in the end. PyTorch has many different optimizers that you can use, and you can very easily swap them out. I'm not going to talk about them in detail because things change quickly for PyTorch, and the options may change, so this might not be a good reference for the future. So take a look at the official documentation, and you'll be able to look at the parameters that you need for each of these optimizers. And so for something simple like stochastic gradient descent, you just need the learning rate. But for uh, LBFGS, you may need uh, the closure. Uh, there may be momentum terms. Uh, just take a look. But I would say if you're just getting started, use something simple like stochastic gradient descent. So we went through a very simple example, but the overall framework can work for arbitrarily complex models. And we'll look at some other models in this class where we're getting multiple layers and more and more complexity. In any event, the key idea is the same. You build computation graphs. The framework gives you automatic differentiation so you can compute the gradients and optimize the model very easily. And you can either build that computation graph by combining existing modules together, or you can define your own modules. Slightly more effort, but once you've defined that uh, backwards message, all of the other work is done for you. One thing that's very common in natural language processing is to use what are called embeddings for word representation. And we'll talk a lot more about this, but I wanted to sort of give you a preview of this while we're talking about these frameworks, because it's very important that these frameworks can also use these embeddings either as a fixed encoding for the words or as something you learn automatically. And so when you learn them with the model, this is typically called fine-tuning embedding. And PyTorch, of course, has support for this. And so you can take any individual word and you can look up a vector for that word. And this is a better representation of the word for reasons that we'll talk about very soon. And you can also do this for, say, the part of speech of the word. And so all of this becomes a very nice representation of the word, better than a one-hot representation of the word, or, say, it's a part of speech. So if you want to use these representations, you can create an embedding layer. And so this is built right into the uh, PyTorch framework, the embedding class. And so you tell it the number of words in your vocabulary and the size of the dimensions of that embedding, and then it requires you to build a lookup tensor where you basically have a word to index function and then you can add that embedding layer to your model. And then it just becomes another parameter that gets optimized with your model. So very soon we'll be talking about why these representations work and how they come about. But for now, this has been a brief introduction to PyTorch, which is a framework that you can use to very quickly prototype models and build up deep learning frameworks for understanding language.